During the Second World War, the government of Canada commissioned artists to record the activities of the Canadian military. Some were sent to Europe, others painted the home front. In all, more than 5,000 paintings were produced. being interviewed to see what part of the military I should fit into properly. And this personnel officer was uh, making out this questionnaire and he asked me what I was doing in civilian life. I told him I was an artist, a commercial artist, and a very good artist. And I noticed he wrote down on the form, no trade. <laughs> At the beginning of the war, the government is reluctant to spend money on a war art program, having just funded the establishment of the National Film Board. When Canada's artists hold their first national conference in 1941, every allied country has established a war art program, except Canada. The artists remind the government that Canada was the first country to establish a program in the First World War. It was one of the most important war art collections in existence. But after the war, it had gone into storage and was rarely seen. A.Y. Jackson, a veteran of the program, could see why the government was in no rush to fund another, but argued that the artist's view was needed, not so much as a record, but as an expression of the period. I didn't know if there was anything like the war artist, but I thought, I'm going to get in the army and I'm going to paint. That's, that was an absolute thing I had in my head. And when I began, I did a diary that is now in archives. And it's maybe the best war art I did, it, it, because it was every day, and it starts out with, I pretended it was a paper, and it starts out with the headline, Girl Takes Drastic Step. Canada's artists sign up for war like other Canadians. New Brunswick artist Miller Britton sketches scenes of a bomber crew's everyday life, sells them to his mates for $5, which he never collects. Commander Harold Beamont uses snatches of off-duty time to record the personnel and routines on his own ship. Others put aside their brushes. Robert Heinemann joins the Air Force. His movie star looks make him a natural for a recruiting poster. Courage and idealism. My life, my whole life was dedicated to painting before this war at all. And uh, I was intending to be, a, be an artist, you know, not, a, not an aviator. But when the war came along, that was, I naturally had to, uh, to do, go do something. So I, I tried to uh, get in the, as a pilot, which worked out. I went in and I had a medical. And they passed me, and then I, and I started down to go outside, and a man stopped me at the door like a guard, and he said, uh, you have to have a pass. And I said, what, what is this? You know, I've got myself into a jail here. 
And I thought, I can't go on with this. I hate this. It's horrible. And the next day, they took me down to the basement, gave me a green uniform and a hairnet, and I had to wait on the soldiers, you know, give them donuts and coffee. And uh, I didn't mind it. I started to think, this is OK, you know, except for the hairnet, because I was vain. And by the third day, I don't think you could pull me out of that army. Three years into the war, and there is still no war art program. From London, Vincent Massey, Canada's High Commissioner and longtime patron of the arts, presses his friend, Mackenzie King, for a program. The camera, he says, is necessarily limited in its use. Massey convinces King that the work of artists is also required if there is to be an adequate record of Canada's war activities. Within months, the first artists, having completed basic officer training, make final preparations to go to Europe. The director of the National Gallery, H. O. McCurry, is to select the participants with the help of eminent artists such as A. Y. Jackson and Arthur Lismer. Joining them are the historical officers of the Army, Navy, and Air Force. The Army representative is the First World War veteran Colonel A. Fortescue Duguid. Duguid expects the art to be accurate, as he informs one artist right down to the placement of the screw heads on the Bren gun. All Duguid's suggestions are foolish, Jackson grumbles to McCurry, and yet to turn them all down will make an enemy of him, and that would end everything. One of the artists that Duguid champions is an infantry officer, Alex Colville. Well, Duguid and I got on well. I suppose Duguid's idea of what a war artist should be doing and my idea of it coincided, more or less. I would want everything to be right, and uh, all my stuff was really quite painstakingly accurate. But McCurry is not impressed. There is a work of Colville's in the present Academy exhibition, and personally, I think it is too dreadful for words. Our reputations will be mud to future generations if better artists are not selected. H. O. McCurry. <laughs> well, you see, I, nev I never knew either of these, either McCurry or Jackson at all well, but I didn't like them. Uh, so there you are. Summer, 1943, the Canadian Army invades Sicily and marches up the Italian peninsula. With the troops is Will Ogilvy, Canada's first war artist to see action. Ogilvy notes in his diary, you can't paint a war, but most artists felt it was their duty to express what the men were going through. Ogilvy's watercolors are hailed by military historians and Vincent Massey as one of the most important pictorial records of the war. The enthusiastic reception is tempered by one dissenting voice. His work is not liked. It is regarded as being too slight, too casual, and not studied enough. Colonel A. Fortescue Duguid. Ogilvy is joined by Lauren P. Harris. Lauren the Lesser, as he calls himself in deference to his famous Group of Seven father. Grateful for the work, Harris wonders about the program's objectives. Couldn't a camera do this? I can remember even mentioning that to Mr. Massey. He said, well, uh, there is a point, because consciously or unconsciously, when you do a sketch, um, you put into it your feeling about it, whereas the camera is almost a mechanical device that just captures what's there, but you can express it in other ways as, as to how you feel. Of all the artists in the program, Charles Comfort 
is seen as the most technically accomplished and resourceful. The operatic quality, in one artist's view, makes his works a natural for recruitment posters. The image of a gun sight, a strange fusion of machine surfaces, the delicate transparent tracery of the nets, then a flower-like pink-edged flame of instant blooming, a shocking, numbing sound, and a concussion that jumps my equipment clear off the ground. One felt suspended, helplessly, in some dense, exhausting element where sound, and sound only, existed. Charles Comfort. The destroyer's decks have few workable spots for painting. The air is usually full of spray. The vibration from our powerful engines and propellers so great that putting a line or brush stroke on paper or canvas is often an exciting gamble. Painting at sea in wartime becomes simply a matter of what wind, weather, the enemy, and the ship herself makes possible. The convoy is a beautiful sight, rolling and plunging. A thrilling performance put on for our special benefit with the war far away. Until action stations are sounded, as possibly somebody gets it. children. Navy artist Leonard Brooks sees his wartime watercolors and oils for the first time in 50 years. Rough weather on a minesweeper. Well, there you are. That's what it felt like. There's the captain and boy that on the bridge there and it's really being tossed around, hollering down and can imagine how that was being tossed. How the hell I painted that in the, with that ship tossing around it. But that's obvious painted on the spot, you see. There's Puncher. There's Puncher here. And you can see she's a, a pretty good sized carrier. And uh, that's a nice, moody, dirty looking sky. and. The, I rather like that one. Now that's a more that's a studio painting which I would work out later. In all these, I'm trying to get the mood, of the feeling, of the place. And you see, you don't see cannons firing and all that stuff. A lot of that's what was going on. It's this kind of stuff that was day after day that was the navy. It wasn't always gung ho action. And this was different than the army, where in Italy, there's that, that's what, so they painted that, that kind of thing. Navy artist Tom Wood. I'll tell you something. Very rarely did you see action in the Hollywood sense of the word. You're stationed on a convoy of about 100 ships. You were aware of the historic event, and you had the good fortune to be involved in a major chunk of human history. But... You're 21 days aboard this ship. You really might say you're in jail for 21 days. I was lucky being a war artist, but the guys that were on that ship were there for three years doing that. Back and forth, back and forth. Tom Wood. Unlike most of the war artists, 
Jack Nichols makes no quick onboard sketches, holds what he sees in his mind until the quiet concentration of the studio. What I remember most about the war is the feeling of being overwhelmed. seeing a ship being hit, and then the people fell into the sea. I couldn't imagine introducing sunlight into any of these pictures. I think of black and white as color, and sometimes it gives off color. I don't try to describe things. You can't put what I do into words. That's why I do paintings. For three years, really, I was a terrible burden on the Canadian taxpayer. I did nothing but sort of eat, I think, as far as I remember, and wait on table or in canteens. I was in the army show. I was moved all over the place. But always I'd hitchhike to Ottawa, and I'd go up to the National Gallery and practically get on my knees and say, Mr. McCurry, make me a war artist. There is no official policy but women are not selected as official war artists. Peggy Nicol McLeod paints on a National Gallery commission. She painted wonderful impressionistic pictures of naval women marching down the street or standing in front of her. She just took the brush, filled it with different colors and went blop, blop, blop for the medals. When the commanding officer saw them, she was furious. Louise Comfort. McLeod's commission is to cover the activities of the Women's Royal Canadian Navy and the Canadian Women's Army Corps, the Wrens and the Quacks. Two months' work, according to McCurry. Would a small honorarium of $300 a month, McCurry inquires coyly, be beneath your notice? To me, it represented a sort of painting holiday, orgy, sans housework. Of course, it's a year's work or more, not two months. Peggy Nichol McLeod. Artist Parashkiva Clark also receives a commission from McCurry. He asks her for a few canvases of an inspirational nature. I'm not awfully anxious, he writes, to have more studies of girls working in kitchens, offices, and that sort of thing. Clark replies, there are no dramatic subjects among the quacks. Being a quack means throwing off the eternal chores and drudgery of a woman's life. There is drama, she wrote, among the women who stayed home, carrying on some job, some responsibility, plus their usual home duties, with their hearts full of constant pain, longing, and sorrow for their men gone fighting. Artist Fred Taylor volunteers to contribute his talent to the war effort. He proposes a series of war production paintings. The government turns him down. His leftist politics make him suspect. I'm determined to break through by any means, however distasteful to me. He must turn to his brother, the wealthy capitalist E.P. Taylor, for help. 
I did so reluctantly by exerting private influence. 24 hours later, I was at work in a Montreal tank arsenal. Management thought I must be some kind of government or labor spy. Labor thought I must be a government or management spy. Interrogations were usually conducted by hoarse shouting above the roar of machinery. Who are you working for? Who is paying you? Why are you doing it? The first few days I spent in each shop were exceedingly trying until I had something to show. Fred Taylor. In spite of his energy and persistence, or perhaps because of it, Taylor is never officially commissioned to do war work. After the war, he gifts the best of his paintings to the National Gallery. Not everyone could get used to the war. It was just happening to you. War artist Campbell Tinning is to recall later. He felt that his real life was on hold. T.R. MacDonald preferred to deal with the war indirectly, seeking images that reflected the atmosphere of wartime London. Miller Burton escapes the pressure of his daily bomber runs by painting scenes of the off-duty lives of Canadian airmen. Having achieved the Billy Bishop dream of his boyhood, fighter pilot Robert Heinemann turns from flying Spitfires to painting Spitfires as an official war artist. The memories of, of the whole business of of flying in a squadron, you know, it was such a tremendously different way of, of being alive. You'd get up and have breakfast and then go over to France and try to get into trouble or cause trouble and come back for lunch. On one occasion that our squadron commander had a direct hit, I think probably on his bomb or his aircraft, and he just blew up into 8,000 pieces. All I could see was thousands of little pieces of the size of a pen floating through space, little black bits of, of him and his aircraft. And uh, it was one of those bright, lovely days from flying back over the channel. I just said to myself, I hate this war. I was just filled with disgust. Something really, really awful it was, it was a terrible feeling. Sees the Governor General and Her Royal Highness Princess Alice open the first nationwide army art exhibit in Canada. A.Y. Jackson, Arthur Lismer, H.O. McCurry, and Henri Masson served as judges. They awarded second prize Lance Corporal Molly Lamb of Vancouver for her pay parade. And first prize, a $100 war bond was won by Sapper Bruno Boback for his cross-country convoy. As a result of his first prize at the Army Art Exhibition, Bruno Boback is invited by Massey to become a war artist after the six-week officer's training course. The six-week period during that course 
was just the time when the D-Day landings were taking place and the actual uh, unit platoon of engineers that I was really part of before I became a war artist, a good many of them were killed just on that first day of uh, landing in Europe. And uh, I'm not a very um, a brilliant guy when it comes to military <laughs> survival, and I'm pretty sure I would have been one of those that was dead on the beach. Coming in after the first assault wave, the Army's Orville Fisher is among the artists recording their impressions of the first anxious days of the Canadians' return to the beaches of France. A good part of the war art subjects appear to be uh, the results of battles rather than the battles themselves. So there'd be ruins of buildings uh, or people uh, begging or people hurt or people injured. And I remember things like uh, nuns uh, coming out of a convent, uh, all dressed in black and looking into this weird kind of uh, landscape. It just seemed to me such a strange combination of uh, contrast between the sort of uh, deserted landscape. Uh, we were close to the front. Front was everywhere, that's the problem. I remember once, um, driving and we came across a crossroads somewhere in Holland. I, I said, I, I think we've gone too far to the driver. I said, those look like two young German soldiers standing there on the corner. Well, at that point, we <laughs> whipped around in a hurry and we were just about as surprised as these two German soldiers were and we were actually in the, on enemy lines, which happened quite frequently because uh, it wasn't like the First World War where you had a line that said this is one side and this is the other side. Indeed, some war artists did get uh, trapped behind the enemy lines. I think George Pepper was uh, one of them. The F title of a painting made by Captain George Pepper of Toronto is Hitler's Youth. During one of his painting expeditions, Captain Pepper was caught behind the German lines. His only food for 10 days was a chicken trapped with his revolver lanyard. The fowl had to be consumed raw. As a war artist, my strongest memory is probably the one where I was being strafed by a low-flying plane and uh, almost got hit. And I remember jumping straight into an old slit trench that was uh, handy right in front of me. And halfway down, I could see I was falling onto a dead soldier. And when I hit him, it went pfft. But I was too chicken to get out. Through towns and villages, wasted by the retreating enemy, the Canadians moved doggedly forward into the freezing rain and mud of the North European winter. With the 3rd Canadian Division in Holland is Alex Colville. I had been in the Army almost exactly two years when I was made a war artist. You know, I, I guess I, had, I felt pleasure for two reasons. Probably, to be frank, number one is the diminution of the chances of being killed, you know. And number two, simple pleasure at being able to paint again and to be paid for it, which seemed astonishing to me. Colville looks back on his war work as an apprenticeship, sketching or painting something every day, regardless of his moods or the weather.
you know, you, you drive by something and you think this is interesting. Uh, you couldn't exactly say why you think it's interesting, but I'd stop and get out of the Jeep and make a drawing of it or something. So you're operating really uh, to a large degree on instinct. Accumulating a precise daily record of his particular corner of the war, but on the lookout for something that would take his art beyond the repertorial. Many of Colville's paintings begin as sketches, evolving into composite scenes that the artist has never actually witnessed. Yet, shades of Colonel Duguid, physical detail is rigorously observed. The job of a corporal, for instance, the leading figure in that is a corporal, and the number one brand had the Bren gun, which was our most advanced light machine gun. The corporal, the head, I realized more after it was all done and years later, that I had, uh, I had depicted my father, who had been a foreman of a riveting gang, who were also doing very dangerous work and often got killed. I didn't always feel pleased with my stuff, Colville admits. But this one, infantry near Nijmegen, had more than just accuracy. Nobody had it worse than the infantry people. That day after day, week after week, month after month, no sleep, nothing more than a couple of hours of snatch sleep and cold, wet, dirty, when you look back on it, you think, how the hell did they do it? I remember uh, Somebody saying, oh, if it's really cold uh, and you're doing some watercolors, uh, why don't you just add a little bit of salt to the water uh, and, and then it won't freeze? Well, I tried that several times and it never really worked because as soon as you brought the artwork indoors or into your tent where it was warm, the whole thing would melt and slide off the paper because <laughs> it only looked good while it was frozen. <laughs> <laughs> I ruined a lot of watercolors that way. <laughs> Among the first artists to be considered for the war art program was Airman Miller Britton. He turned them down. At the time, I was about to start air crew training, after marching, scrubbing floors, and shoveling snow for several months. I was flattered to be included, but I felt it was not for me until I had tasted war in the air. While Britain flew, Paul Gorenson documented and gains the admiration of the Air Force by his complete disregard for danger in making his paintings. After two years of active duty as a bomb aimer, Miller Britton writes to McCurry that he is ready to be a war artist, but not without misgivings. I wonder how far it is possible for a person like me, who is fundamentally interested in human beings, to capture the sinister fairyland of a target on canvas or paper. A German city under bombing often looked like a casket of jewels opening up in some Walt Disney film. It was terrible. It was wicked. But there was a fascinating beauty to it. My target picture looks like the real thing, they say. In fact, at the moment, I feel like putting my foot through it. 
Miller Britton. I think he was quite destroyed by the war. You know, he really had a hard time ever coming back. He was one of the most sensitive people I, I knew, and I think he suffered. And he would have wanted to stay with his group, him with his little poems of Blake in his pocket, you know. Mm -hmm. Quite a man. The end of the war finds war artist Abba Bayevsky stationed just a few miles from a German concentration camp, liberated by the British. During the war, I saw people uh, at the airfields, I saw people not returning from operations, and all of that's very touching and very moving. But the one area that I have never forgotten and is still with me to this day, is Belson Concentration Camp. When I got there, I realized, you know, that this was a moment of decision for me. You know, my life as a Jewish young man had known anti-Semitism, nothing of this sort. I realized that this is where I should be. I wasn't assigned to that. But that's where I was and where I intended to stay. There are people who don't like to look at them and, you know, feel upset by looking at them. But I think the reasons why I did it, I, I trust, are clear. My intention was to make sure that this was put on record. And that's what uh, I think I did. I just, Jackson and I just clicked. We, we're great, great friends, and we'd laugh, and we'd talk about war and peace, and he'd smoke away. He never smoked before 12 in the morning, and then he'd never stop. I showed him my war diary, and he thought it was very funny. I think that's really what gave him the idea, you know, mm. that it would be nice to be, have me as a war artist. as Molly Lamb heads overseas for a six-month assignment with Canada's post-war army in Europe, many of the overseas war artists are heading home to complete their work and to be photographed by Malik before heading off into civilian life. I like Charles Comfort. He was a very sweet man, very um, proud of himself. And I remember when we all got back to Ottawa, we had to go with McCurry and have a photograph taken of all the Army war artists together. And I remember seeing Charles just before the photographer got busy going <laughs> like that to his eyebrows. But he, he was very vain, but he was kind and he was a brilliant technically artist, I think. Oh, it's very easy for me to say whose work I feel has been underestimated, never given its due. That was Charles Goldhammer's drawings that he did for airmen who were burned. And I don't think anyone else, including Abba Biefsky, did work of that intensity.
The story goes that when someone asked Goldhammer why he sketched such hard scenes to look at, he replied, I was asked to go either on an aircraft carrier or to a hospital, and the aircraft carrier didn't interest me. I knew the food was good in the hospital. Canadian food, and they had real meat and ice cream. No, oh, I'm not so sure. I, 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 I would, uh, I, I think that sounds like a story. I think that uh, Charlie didn't care that much for ice cream. The artists returned to a major exhibition at the National Gallery. For the younger artists, it helped establish their careers as painters, even though they were still in their early 20s. The governor general was there, and uh, most of the war artists were high as kites. I remember Will Ogilvy had sent them <laughs> running down the sides of his mouth. Missing from the exhibition, however, were Charlie Goldhammer's sketches of burnt airmen, an oversight that greatly disappointed him. The war itself uh, was uh, an, 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 a revelation to me. It opened up horizons for me. It opened up uh, a universality that I never had before. I mean, I was a pretty r rustic local guy back in Canada, although I thought I was sophisticated. It changed my life because I was just beginning to live. I was young, so I never knew any other kind of life. I mean, I, this was the beginning for me, and it's, it's never stopped. You know, I'm 76 at this point, and I'm still painting. I enjoyed it. At the same time, it, it was a d dimension of fear and, and uh, a little tension of all this, that sort of thing, and, and uh, but you can't help being excited by flying a Spitfire in action. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a, a great moment in life. It was a horrible war. And I think that um, anyone that escaped like I did, and Paris Kiefer Clark is right, it was easier to be in the quacks than to be at home waiting for some guy that might never come home, you know. I think that's true. Of her painting, When Johnny Comes Marching Home, Peggy Nicol McLeod wrote, Though drafted for years into the army, Johnny returns to find everything the same. The life of the block doesn't change much. Girls marry, neighborhood boys, take flats across the street or nearby. Families remain for years. Uh, there was something wonderful about the faces of those young men in those days. They, they had a, 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 somehow a greater depth than one sees in the average way of life. All of us, I think, painted things that were much more grounded and earthy as opposed to the, uh, you know, an heroic statement. The posters for the war were heroic. You know, people were marching and their arms were forward and their helmets and their guns and so on. But they were posters. They weren't paintings of an actuality that I saw. You did what you could do, and I recorded everything that I could. And some of the pictures were wrought and some were good. But I kept at it. And sometimes I was very frustrated because I didn't do what I'd like to have done. I happen to think that the judgment of time is just and acute, you know, proper. And so I find this encouraging, actually. Maybe that's why I believe it, because it is an encouraging, kind of an upbeat thought. But I, I think this is actually what does happen. And uh, so it's kind of comforting to think that the stuff that's really just junk will go. 
because there's a lot of it. God knows, really. Women having gas drill, and they're all <laughs> standing there with these snouts on, and one of them can't get it on, and it's in the snow, and it's a little bit subjective, but it's funny, and I think it's a good painting. It's white and red brick and khaki. It's, I think it works quite well as a painting. And in a way, I think it was a, um, the, the whole making fun of oneself was to be really funny so you could be serious about it. After the war, some of us survived and some of us got a larger reputation and then some of us just faded away and disappeared. Um, but whatever, whatever happened, we're in the history books and uh, we're there forever now. There's a long, long trail winding into the land of my dream. And the nightingale is singing. Well, Official war artist Molly Lamb and